The principal takeaways of today's session related to the issue of biosimilars uh, and then specifically the scientific aspects of them as well as some of the practical considerations. From a scientific end, we spent a fair bit of time going over um, the, the degree to which biosimilars, uh, which are molecules that have been developed based on a parent molecule, a uh, biologic molecule such as uh, adalidumab, where some, a molecule has been developed which is supposed to be biosimilar, identical to it, at the degree to which that science behind this uh, actually resulted in a product that was, uh, that was similar, um, to the aspects of how we would then assess whether that's the case from clinical testing, measuring immunogenicity, uh, measuring clinical effect, uh, looking at comparing these drugs, but also whether this would be done in a head-to-head -head fashion as well as switching so that if you were on the parent molecule and you switch to the biosimilar, what would be the impact in the efficacy and in the safety for that patient? The second part of a course is the practical part which deals with how these drugs will get implemented in the clinic in different countries. Um, whether or not this will be something that physicians will have a choice with, whether it will be implemented by payers, um, and whether it will be uh, at initiation when the decision is made to make a biologic or whether a patient's been on a biologic for a long time and then is asked to switch. So regarding the first question, the scientific nature um, and regarding the, um, the bioequivalence, I think in, in our discussion and review of posters and I guess the discussion around the world's literature, um, the feeling is that these molecules uh, are essentially bioequivalent at least from a, um, a synthetic point of view in terms of the way that they've been produced. In terms of whether or not they are equivalent in the clinic, in terms of achieving endpoints such as a POSSE 75, POSSE 90, POSSE 100, um, the preliminary investigations from the posters we've seen uh, appear to be, the answer appears to be yes. Um, the problem is that, that it's not definitive yet because sometimes the endpoints that are chosen, the timing of those endpoints, whether we've had enough time to see whether or not they will continue to respond, whether patients will, whether, the, whether if they are immunogenic and patients are going to um, have loss of efficacy over time, we will need time. And many of the studies that we've seen are short duration studies. This is particularly important when we're looking at switching. So when you're on the parent molecule, like adalidumab, you switch to a biosimilar and then you switch back. The issue is, um, have you given enough time to see whether or not that immunological priming, if you will, is going to have an impact on efficacy down the line and on safety? So there was as many pitfalls as there are questions, I think, at this stage. But um, uh, certainly, I think the posters generated discussion around this point. Um, the other issue that's very important and quite controversial is the issue of immunogenicity. And while immunogenicity um, is felt to be central of importance to the biosimilars, the sense that if you're given a molecule and it, is, it does create an immunogenic response, so if the molecule is presented as an antigen, as a foreign protein to the body and you develop antibodies against it, these are so-called anti-drug antibodies, the question is, is there a difference in these levels of anti-drug anti antibodies to the, the, the parent molecule and the biosimilar? And the problem is, is that the world of testing for immunogenicity is very controversial. It's not standard. And in many sense, you get what you look for. So you can have some assays which are not very sensitive at all versus other assays which are highly sensitive within the same type of assay versus newer methods of detection which are much more sophisticated in their ability to detect antibodies. 
So, you know, we compare these and, we, and, and when you realize that the testing is done in an inconsistent manner um, using, for example, an ELISA, which may be uh, not very accurate or uh, may not be able to detect in the presence of drug, so-called drug tolerance, um, compared to another method which is much more sensitive, much more specific, has ability to test, uh, has good drug tolerance, able to detect in the presence. You know, so these are the, the other question is, what's the relevance of the testing, even if it's positive? The truth of the matter is, what's really important to clinicians is the impact on efficacy. Do, do those anti-drug antibodies actually mean anything? We often talk about neutralizing and non-neutralizing. But really, the question is, how does that impact the drug levels as well as the efficacy that we see in the skin? And I think one of the concepts that comes out is that in dermatology, we have the ability to see what's happening, whereas in other fields like gastroenterology, they can ask symptoms such as about diarrhea and abdominal pain. But in order to actually assess the impact of immunogenicity in terms of loss of efficacy, they may need to do, need to do moderately invasive tests such as an endoscopy or a colonoscopy, whereas we can see what's happening. So there are differences between disciplines uh, in the way of measuring this. There's different scientific principles underlying it. There's different application of those principles. And of course, um, ultimately at the end of it all, there is the patient, which is what's relevant to them. How does the efficacy play out? How does the safety play out? So we had a fairly detailed discussion about this. Uh, relating to the basic science of biosimilars as related to immunogenicity, as related to study trial design, the timing of metrics, when we should be seeing what we're seeing. And it was a robust and lively discussion, which while not answered by the posters, the posters created, I think, um, a stimulus with which to discuss this topic. And I think the people who were attending it learned uh, a lot uh, from that discussion as it helped them apply these principles to new data that's coming out so they can ask these key questions to see whether or not this, the results are valid, valid, interpretable, and generalizable, for example, to their molecule, to patients. Uh, and the second part, which is the practical aspects of this, I think it's the message that comes out of our discussions talking to colleagues throughout Europe and North America, um, is that this is an evolving area. It's not at all clear how these drugs will be introduced and that we are really not making these decisions entirely by ourselves. In fact, payers, regulatory agencies, governments are going to play a key part in deciding how and when we use these molecules. Uh, although as physicians who uh, ultimately write prescriptions, decide for our patients, we are at the table, but there are other forces at play that may be quite different in the way that we manage patients with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis going forward.